Hello, hello, good afternoon. How is everybody today? I'm doing pretty well. I'm doing better today than yesterday. I am so sorry. I apologize. I could not hop on live yesterday. There were more pressing things to get done um, besides on Facebook, had some, some COVID related things at my husband's work. Uh, some people tested positive, so we had to get some, or weren't feeling well and anticipated they were going to test positive, got them some tests and everything like that. Um, they did test positive, overall mild symptoms. Anyway, that was more pressing. Everybody should be fine. Uh, my husband and I are fine. So anyway, I apologize for not being able to come on live yesterday. So because I missed yesterday and I am doing the four steps to feel better, I am continuing that conversation today. I will do step uh, three and four today. I can't, I, I may have titled this wrong. I may have said two and three. Really, this is three and four. I can't count. You guys will notice that's going to be a common theme for me. I forget how many I've already done or what step number I'm on. I promise the content is there. The counting might be wrong. So I might say there are five things and there are six. Or I might say I've already done three when I've only done two. So forgive me. I'm human. I promise the content and the information is there. And well, you might just get a little math lesson too. So, yes, so I am talking four steps to feel better. Today, we are talking about diet and sleep. So let's talk about diet first. That is step number three. What do I mean by diet? Diet, I don't mean in the sense of diet to lose weight. Diet, I mean as in what you are eating, what you are ingesting, what you are drinking, what you are putting in your body. So diet as a generalized, this is how you eat and drink, not cutting calories kind of diet. So just as clarification. And specifically, I am going to talk about eating foods, drinking liquids, that help inflammation, to help prevent inflammation from coming on and help decrease any inflammation that is in your body. So many of you know that um, I have, I started out as a physical therapist 10 years ago. I got my license in 2012, continued on working with people who have a lot of pain, a lot of inflammation, specifically people who have arthritis, osteoarthritis, mainly degenerative joints, degenerative discs, things like that. And one thing I noticed in the physical therapy clinic was that some people just flat out weren't getting better. We tried all the heat. We tried all the ice. They were trying all the creams. They were trying all the exercises. Sometimes they couldn't exercise. Sometimes they could exercise. And then in 2018, I went out on my own. I created my own business for a couple of reasons. The main reason was that the system was broken. The physical therapy clinic system, healthcare system in general is broken. Most clinics work for the insurance companies and not for the patient. So what do I mean by that? They do things just because insurance pays for it, or they don't do things because insurance doesn't pay for it. So one thing I noticed when I was in the physical therapy clinic was, although I had some nutrition information in my in my noggin here, I could not disseminate that information to my patients. Insurance did not pay for nutritional advice from a physical therapist. So that meant that my patient could, I could give them a little bit of information, like very little snippets or give them handouts, but I couldn't dive deep into it because if I took too long, that would cut, a, cut into the insurance paying minutes. So everything had to be really short and sweet. And I had to say very quick things. And that just is not what people um, needed or wanted. So went out on my own. And over the past couple of years, 
my husband's journey with his autoimmune disease that most doctors told him was non-existent and that his symptoms were fake. And I knew that wasn't true. And so I did a lot of my own research into his celiac disease and eating differently to calm down inflammation. And, le- and I learned a lot about the inflammatory connection with food that way. I went on and got my nutrition coaching certification because I had already learned all the information, might as well make it official. And with his celiac disease, we found out, yes, of course he needs to eat gluten-free because he does have that, um, gluten sensitivity, gluten allergy, whatever you want to call it. He can't eat gluten, but he wasn't feeling good still, even with all of that. So that made us dive in deeper. Was he allergic to dairy? And we thought for the longest time that he was allergic to dairy. So for a very long time, I mean, up until probably two months ago, I was cooking dairy free for him and he still wasn't feeling good. Well, turns out he actually can't have a lot of nightshades. Some nightshades create an inflammatory reaction for him. So he can't have, we actually haven't introduced any new nightshades. We tried, excuse me, let me back up. We tried reintroducing one nightshade, green chili peppers, because I cook a lot of Mexican food and I make an enchilada dish with um, green chili peppers. And he did not tolerate that well. So we haven't reintroduced anything else, but we found out that a lot of the cheese, the shredded cheese that he had, had potato starch in it. Potato, white potato is a nightshade. And so I started buying the the shredded cheese that didn't have the potato starch in it because he could have sliced cheese, like get up, buy a block of it. We could cut it up, slice it up. And he was fine. Cheddar cheese that way was fine, but shredded cheddar cheese was not fine. And it was the weirdest thing to us. So we just figured it had something to do with the amount that we were putting in. Well, nope, because now he can have the shredded cheddar cheese as long as it doesn't have potato starch in it. So anyway, so I've learned all of these different things and his inflammation has calmed down significantly. He doesn't have back pain anymore. And his other symptoms have reduced. They're never going to go away completely. Um, and it's a battle we're going to deal with for the rest of our lives. I call it navigating the new normal. So he's going to have to eat like this for the rest of his life. So for the most part, I eat like this too. And so what do we do? So obviously we cut out gluten. I actually don't recommend everybody cut out gluten. I don't think it's an all encompassing thing. I don't think we're all allergic to gluten. I don't think we're all sensitive to gluten. Um, But if you do think that you have a gluten sensitivity or a wheat allergy or a rye allergy or a barley allergy or any of their derivatives, get an allergy test to find out to see if you should cut out gluten. Because cutting out gluten, if you're allergic to it, is going to calm down your inflammation. And the inflammation is not just going to be on the inside. It's going to be everywhere. If you have a weak link, if you have a bum shoulder, your shoulder is going to start hurting. Like, have you ever heard, you know, the old, old wives tale of, oh, well, I can tell when it's going to rain because my knee starts hurting. It's true. It's the weak link. And so if there's some kind of change, a barometric change or a diet change or something, then you're going to feel it at the weak link. So if you are allergic or sensitive to gluten, cut out gluten. That will help inflammation. And you you have to cut it out completely if you're allergic to or sensitive to it. There's no, oh, well, I'll just cheat a little bit. There's no cheating. If, If he eats gluten, bad news bears. So if you eat gluten, it's going to be bad news bears if you're allergic or sensitive to it. Same thing with dairy. If you're allergic or sensitive to dairy, cow's milk, goat's milk, sheep's milk, any of them, you want to get tested and see if you are allergic to them before you cut it out. But if you're allergic or sensitive to it, that will help with your inflammation. Now, the next two things I do highly recommend everybody does. I don't have to eat an anti-inflammatory diet because I don't have 
the same kind of inflammatory problems that my husband has, but I cook this way and I actually do feel a lot better now that we eat this way than how I used to feel. And you don't know it until you've tried it. Like two years ago, eating, like I love Olive Garden. I love Olive Garden. Chicken scampi, it's delicious. Their breadsticks, delicious. And so, you know, I would I would eat that fine, no problem, because I didn't have any allergy or sensitivity or anything like that. And then um, at the beginning of 2021, we cut out sugar, refined sugar for my husband's diet. He'd been told for a year to do it. We kind of dabbled. So we did it. And we didn't go cold turkey. We eased into it. And if you want to know how I did that, uh, make a comment here and I'll give you the handout that I share with my clients on how we went sugar free. And, and so in that time where we were going sugar free, we weren't going out to eat. We, I was cooking everything at home, breakfast, lunch, dinner, snacks, everything like that. And then after we cut out the sugar and we were adding some things back in, you know, I got Olive Garden with a friend and I was exhausted that afternoon after lunch. And I was like, what the heck is going on? Like, I feel like I could go take a three hour nap. Well, that was just because of how heavy that meal was. And it's the chicken scampi. It's not chicken, alf- or, you know, fettuccine Alfredo with the creamy, heavy sauce or anything like that. It's like a garlic butter sauce. It's relatively light for what they have. So anyway, but I didn't know how tired and how quote unquote bad it made me feel until I had it again later. So you don't know how it's affecting you unless you stop having it and then go back and reintroduce it. So anyway, so we cut out sugar. So sugar really does inflame your body. It sticks to different places. Um, You know, sugar can deposit anywhere if there's excess sugar. So one problem with diabetes, for example, is, you know, they say cut out sugar. Well, why? I mean, yes, the sugar is the glucose in your bloodstream that makes the body go crazy. In With diabetes, um, your body doesn't know how to or stops producing the insulin. Insulin is what helps control the sugar levels in your body. So like if you eat a Snickers bar, your, your body says to produce insulin, tells your pancreas to produce insulin to handle all of the sugar that's in your bloodstream. Well, if you have diabetes, your body doesn't know how to do that and doesn't do it as well. And so type two diabetes and So then you have all this excess sugar. Well, that excess sugar is floating around in your bloodstream and it can deposit on your nerves and then it eats away at your nerves and then you get neuropathy and then you can't feel your feet. And then because you have so much sugar level in your bloodstream, your your body can't handle injury. So if you get a cut on your foot and you have, type two diabetes, well, your foot now can't heal that cut, turns into a bigger cut, an ulcer, then it can go gangrene and die, and then an amputation. So that's a very extreme example, but that's one thing that sugar does to the body. And it can deposit anywhere, and it can inflame your body because your body does isn't used to it and just doesn't like having so much in there. So cutting out refined sugar, the sugar, the only sugar I cook with is pure maple syrup, coconut sugar, coconut palm sugar, or raw honey. That's it. Those are the sugars that I cook with. Did I have ice cream last night? Yep, I did. But now I know that because dinner had no sugar in it, I know exactly how much sugar I put in my body through however much ice cream I ate. So cutting out sugar with initially getting it gone completely and then reintroducing just a little bit is what I recommend people do to control their inflammation. 
and then cutting out saturated or bad fats. So vegetable oils, seed oils, um, you know, too much butter, things like that. Eating good fats. So avocado, um, some butter is okay. You know, when I say cut out too much butter, like really it's too much butter. Uh, cooking with extra virgin olive oil instead, cooking with avocado oil, some coconut oil, not too much. You don't want to go too crazy on that. But cutting out the saturated fats, the trans fats, um, those, those inflame your body as well. So that was a long story to tell you about the anti-inflammatory diet. So I'll recap those for you. So cutting out gluten or dairy, if you're allergic or sensitive to them to help with your inflammation, I do recommend everybody cut out refined sugars. So cane sugars, brown sugars, um, things like that. You can cook with raw honey, pure maple syrup, coconut sugar, and then sugars that naturally come from fruit. So an apple, strawberries, those are fine. Um, and then cutting out saturated fats, so vegetable oils, Crisco, shortenings, things like that. Okay, so eating an anti-inflammatory diet can help with inflammation. So next one, the next step, step number four of four to feel better now is to get better sleep. Wouldn't we all like to do that? Wouldn't we all like to sleep? I don't have an issue sleeping. My husband has an issue sleeping. A lot of people have issues sleeping and it doesn't have to be that way. Often sleep is disrupted for a few reasons. So hormone imbalances will really disrupt your sleep because hormones help regulate your circadian rhythm. So your wake sleep cycle, um, inflammation, can be controlled by your hormones too. So if you have too much cortisol going through your body, the stress hormone, that will interrupt your sleep as well. So if you're a really stressed out person, you probably have cortisol coursing throughout your body. That's really going to disrupt your sleep. And then just getting into a better routine. So if if you go to bed really late, but you have to wake up really early and you're only getting a couple of hours of sleep, well, maybe you're not getting as much sleep as you need. I like to get my eight hours, sometimes nine hours of sleep. It's no, it's no secret. We go to bed at 8.30 every single night. Every single night, my phone goes on, do not disturb. You send me a text message after 8.30 Pacific. I'm not getting it until the next morning because I'm in bed. I am, maybe I'm not asleep yet at 830. Maybe it's nine o'clock or 930. I mean, last night I know I was asleep by nine o'clock and, and we wake up, our alarm goes off at five o'clock every morning. So we go to bed at 830. So then I know that waking up at five gets me my eight hours. So having a routine, it takes a lot of time to get into that routine. You know, if you're used to going to bed at midnight, you can't just all of a sudden go to bed at 830. So you can do a couple of different things. You can stay up longer than 24 hours. That didn't work for me because I actually get a second wind past the 24 hours. So it's like I'm really tired at like 20 hours of being awake. And then by the time it's time to go to bed the next day, I'm wired again. So that kind of thing doesn't work for me. What actually worked for me was going to bed um, half an hour earlier every week for the whole week, and then half an hour earlier the next week until we got to the 8.30 bedtime. And it was more important for us to wake up early because we both are much more productive in the morning. And I find that if I don't have my normal morning routine, then I'm a jerk during the day. I'm just, I'm on edge. I'm antsy. I feel like everybody is annoying me. But if I have my morning routine, which is get up while Royal's in the shower, go downstairs, make my coffee, crawl back into bed with Levi, our dog, 
and have my coffee first thing in the morning that way. And I get to scroll through Facebook and I get to look at some emails, whatever, just do my thing, just kind of warm up for the day. It's much better. It's not hectic. It's not, it doesn't make me as anxious and going to bed at the same time every night helps me wake up that way. So going to bed and waking up at the same time every day will significantly help your, your inflammation. So that might mean saying no to some things on nights, weekends, like, nope, I'm not going to go see that movie. Nope. I'm not going to go to that event because my health is more important than that thing. Or let's move that thing to earlier in the day. Can we go to a movie at four o'clock in the afternoon instead? Another thing that I do at night that really helps calm me down is I have um, a cup of lavender tea before I go to bed. I actually do it year round, even in the heat of the Las Vegas summer. I'll have a cup of lavender tea, hot lavender tea at like seven o'clock to start winding down. Sometimes I'll have another one and um, I make sure that I stop drinking my tea by about 745 because otherwise I'm going to be up going to the bathroom in the middle of the night. I stop drinking tea about an hour before I plan to be asleep. And that really, really helps. I really like it. I also diffuse lavender oil in a diffuser. Lavender scent helps calm people down. You breathe it in and it, the, it just stimulates some receptors for a calm, peaceful, relaxing environment. So that really helps us. And then clear your mind before you go to sleep. Um, do a brain dump from the day. I actually, I don't do this one because as soon as an idea comes into my mind, I pick up my phone. I have an Apple phone and I just ask Siri to make a reminder for myself and I have it um, put away. So as soon as it comes into my mind, it goes in there. So then I can forget about it. But a lot of people will take a journal and just write down all of the things that are in their head for that night from the day so then they can get it out and it doesn't need to spin in their wheels. They don't need to worry of, oh, I need to remember this in the morning. I need to remember this in the morning. I need to, I need to, I need to. Well, it's already written down. So just go back and look at it the next morning. So you don't need to think of, oh, well, Johnny's baseball practice is at three tomorrow instead of four. I need to remember to pick him up from school and go bring him there. Nope. Write it down so it's out of your head and you don't need to worry about it because having those thoughts running through your mind as you're going to sleep is going to increase your, um, your fight or flight response. It's going to make you more amped up and it's going to make it a lot harder to go to sleep. So just take a journal, take your phone, write it out, type it in, whatever you have to do to get those thoughts and those feelings out from the day and into onto the paper or into the phone so that you don't have to think about it anymore. And so those are my tips for better sleep. So getting a good routine of waking up and going to bed at the same time every night, drinking a cup of lavender tea and diffusing lavender oil. You can even um, put oil like on your wrist, um, a dab under your nose so that you can smell it and then clear your mind when you're going to sleep. So you don't have all those thoughts buzzing around in your head and you can have a good night's sleep. Okay. So that was two in one today. We talked about the anti-inflammatory diet, cutting out sugar and bad fats, and then cutting out dairy and gluten. If you're allergic or sensitive to it, and then getting better sleep by forming a routine, going to bed and waking up at the same time every day, having a cup of lavender tea, diffusing lavender oil, and then getting those thoughts in feelings out of your brain before you go to sleep. As always, send me some comments and questions that you guys want answers to, and I'm happy to answer them on here, and I will see you guys soon.